Joseph Broz Cyrillic Joseph Broz pronounced Joseph B R O circumflex Z the 7th of May 1892 to the 4th of May 1980 commonly known as Tito Cyrillic Tito pronounced Tito was a Yugoslav communist revolutionary and political leader serving in various roles from 1943 until his death in 1980 during World War II, he was the leader of the Partisans, often regarded as the most effective resistance movement in occupied Europe. While his presidency has been criticized as authoritarian and concerns about the repression of political opponents have been raised, some historians consider him a benevolent dictator. He was a popular public figure both in Yugoslavia and abroad. Viewed as a unifying symbol, his internal policies maintained the peaceful coexistence of the nations of the Yugoslav Federation. He gained further international attention as the chief leader of the non-aligned movement, alongside Jawaharlal Nehru of India, Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, Sukarno of Indonesia, and Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. Broz was born to a Croat father and Slovene mother in the village of Kumrovic, Austria-Hungary now in Croatia. Drafted into military service, he distinguished himself, becoming the youngest sergeant major in the Austro-Hungarian army of that time. After being seriously wounded and captured by the Imperial Russians during World War I, he was sent to a work camp in the Ural Mountains. He participated in some events of the Russian Revolution in 1917 and subsequent civil war. Upon his return home, Broz found himself in the newly established Kingdom of Yugoslavia, where he joined the Communist Party of Yugoslavia KPJ. He was General Secretary later Chairman of the Presidium of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia 1939 and went on to lead the World War II Yugoslav guerrilla movement, the Partisans 1941 After the war, he was the Prime Minister 1944 President later President for Life 1953 of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia SFRY. From 1943 to his death in 1980, he held the rank of Marshal of Yugoslavia, serving as the Supreme Commander of the Yugoslav Military, the Yugoslav People's Army JNA. With a highly favorable reputation abroad in both Cold War blocs, he received some 98 foreign decorations, including the Legion of Honor and the Order of the Bath. Tito was the chief architect of the Second Yugoslavia, a socialist federation that lasted from November 1942 until April 1992. Despite being one of the founders of Cominform, he became the first Cominform member to defy Soviet hegemony in 1948 and the only one in Joseph Stalin's time to manage to leave Cominform and begin with its own socialist program with elements of market socialism. Economists active in the former Yugoslavia, including Czech-born Yaroslav Vanek and Croat-born Branko Horvat, promoted a model of market socialism dubbed the Illyrian model, where firms were socially owned by their employees and structured on workers' self-management and competed with each other in open and free markets. <laughs> Early life <laughs> Pre-World War I Josip Broz was born on 7 May 1892 in Kumrovic, a village in the northern Croatian region of Hrvatsko Zagorje, which at that time was part of the Kingdom of Croatia Slavonia within the Austro Hungarian Empire. He was the seventh or eighth child of Franjo Broz and Maria Ne Javisic, his parents having already lost a number of children in early infancy. He was christened and raised as a Roman Catholic. His father, Franjo, was a Croat whose family had lived in the village for three centuries, while his mother Maria, was a Slovene from the village of Podzreda. The villages were only 16 kilometers 10 miles apart, and his parents had been married on 21 January 1881. Franjo Bros had inherited a 4.0 hectare 10 acre estate and a good house, but he was unable to make a success of farming. Josip spent a significant proportion of his pre-school years living with his maternal grandparents at Podzreda, where he became a favorite of his grandfather Martin Javisic, and by the time he returned to Kumrovic to commence school he spoke Slovene better than Croatian, and had learned to play the piano. Despite his mixed parentage, Broz is often referred to as an ethnic Croat. In July 1900, at the age of eight, Broz entered primary school at Kumrovic, but only completed four years of school, failing the second grade then graduating in 1905. As a result of his limited schooling, throughout his life he was poor at spelling. After leaving school, he initially worked for a maternal uncle then on the family farm. 
In 1907, his father wanted him to emigrate to the United States, but could not raise the money for the voyage. Instead, aged 15 years, Josip left Komrovik and traveled about 97 kilometers 60 miles south to Sisak where his cousin Yuritsa Broz was doing army service. Yuritsa helped him get a job in a restaurant, but Broz soon tired of that work and approached a Czech locksmith, Nikola Karas, for a three-year apprenticeship, which included training, food, and room and board. As his father could not afford to pay for his work clothing, Josip paid for it himself. Soon after, his younger brother Stepan also became apprenticed to Karas. During his apprenticeship, he was encouraged to mark May Day in 1909 and read and sold Slobodna Rek, Free Word, a socialist newspaper. After completing his apprenticeship in September 1910, Broz used his contacts to gain employment in Zagreb and at the age of 18 joined the Metal Workers Union and participated in his first labor protest. He also joined the Social Democratic Party of Croatia and Slavonia. He returned home in December 1910 and in early 1911 began a series of moves, first seeking work in Ljubljana then Trieste, Komrovic and Zagreb, where he worked repairing bicycles and joined his first strike action on May Day 1911. After a brief period of work in Ljubljana, between May 1911 and May 1912 he worked in a factory in Kamnik in the kamnik savinja Alps, and when it closed, he was offered redeployment to Senkov in Bohemia. On arriving at his new workplace he discovered that the employer was trying to bring in cheaper labor to replace the local Czech workers, and he and others joined successful strike action to force the employer to back down, driven by curiosity. Broz then moved to Polzen where he was briefly employed at the Škoda Works, then traveled to Munich in Bavaria. He also worked at the Benz car factory in Mannheim, and visited the Ruhr. By October 1912 he had arrived in Vienna where he stayed with his older brother Martin and his family and worked at the Gretel Works before getting a job at Wiener Neustadt where he worked for Ostro Daimler, and was often asked to drive and test the cars. During this time he spent considerable time fencing and dancing, and during his training and early work life he also learned German and passable Czech. Topic. World War I. In May 1913, Broz was conscripted into the Austro-Hungarian army, for his compulsory two years of service. He successfully requested that he serve with the 25th Croatian Home Guard Croatian, Domobran regiment garrisoned in Zagreb. After learning to ski during the winter of 1913-1914, he was sent to a school for noncommissioned officers in Budapest, after which he was promoted to sergeant major, and, at 22 years of age, became the youngest of that rank in his regiment. At least one source states that he was also the youngest sergeant major in the Austro-Hungarian army. After winning the regimental fencing competition, Broz went on to come second in the army fencing championships in Budapest in May 1914. Soon after the outbreak of World War I in 1914, the 25th Croatian Home Guard Regiment marched towards the Serbian border, but Broz was arrested for sedition and imprisoned in the Petrovaradin fortress in present-day Novi Sad. Broz later gave conflicting accounts of this arrest, telling one biographer that he had threatened to desert to the Russians, but also claiming that the whole matter arose from a clerical error. A third version was that he had been overheard saying that he hoped the Austro-Hungarian Empire would be defeated. After his acquittal and release, his regiment served briefly on the Serbian front before being deployed to the Eastern Front in Galicia in early 1915 to fight against Russia. On one occasion, the scout platoon he commanded went behind the enemy lines and captured 80 Russian soldiers, bringing them back to their own lines alive. In 1980 it was discovered that he had been recommended for an award for gallantry and initiative in reconnaissance and capturing prisoners. On 25 March 1915, he was wounded in the back by a Circassian cavalryman's lance, and captured during a Russian attack near Bukovina. Now a prisoner of war, Pau, Broz was transported east to a hospital established in an old monastery in the town of Sviazovsk on the Volga River near Kazan. During his 13 months in hospital he had bouts of pneumonia and typhus, and learned Russian with the help of two schoolgirls who brought him Russian classics by such authors as Tolstoy and Turgenev to read. After recuperating, in mid-1916 he was transferred to the Artatov Pau camp in the Samara Governorate, where he used his skills to maintain the nearby village grain mill. At the end of the year, he was again transferred, this time to the Kungor Pau camp near Perm where the Pows were used as labor to maintain the newly completed Trans-Siberian Railway. Broz was appointed to be in charge of all the Pows in the camp. 
During this time he became aware that the Red Cross parcels sent to the POWs were being stolen by camp staff. When he complained, he was beaten and put in prison. During the February Revolution, a crowd broke into the prison and returned Bros to the POW camp. A Bolshevik he had met while working on the railway told Bros that his son was working in an engineering works in Petrograd, so, in June 1917, Bros walked out of the unguarded POW camp and hit aboard a goods train bound for that city, where he stayed with his friend's son. The journalist Richard West has suggested that because Bros chose to remain in an unguarded POW camp rather than volunteer to serve with the Yugoslav legions of the Serbian army, this indicates that he remained loyal to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and undermines his later claim that he and other Croat POWs were excited by the prospect of revolution and looked forward to the overthrow of the empire that ruled them. Less than a month after Bros arrived in Petrograd, the July Days demonstrations broke out, and Bros joined in, coming under fire from government troops. In the aftermath, he tried to flee to Finland in order to make his way to the United States, but was stopped at the border. He was arrested along with other suspected Bolsheviks during the subsequent crackdown by the Russian provisional government led by Alexander Kerensky. He was imprisoned in the Peter and Paul Fortress for three weeks, during which he claimed to be an innocent citizen of Perm. When he finally admitted to being an escaped POW, he was to be returned by train to Kungor, but escaped at Yekaterinburg, then caught another train which reached OMSK in Siberia on 8 November after a 3,200-kilometre journey. At one point, police searched the train looking for an escaped POW, but were deceived by Bros's fluent Russian. In OMSK the train was stopped by local Bolsheviks who told Bros that Vladimir Lenin had seized control of Petrograd. They recruited him into an international Red Guard which guarded the Trans-Siberian Railway during the winter of 1917-1918. In May 1918, the anti-Bolshevik Czechoslovak Legion wrested control of parts of Siberia from Bolshevik forces, and the provisional Siberian government established itself in OMSK, and Bros and his comrades went into hiding. At this time Bros met a beautiful 14-year-old local girl, Pelagia Poka. Belisova, who hid him then helped him escape to a Kyrgyz village 64 kilometers 40 miles from OMSK. Bros again worked maintaining the local mill until November 1919 when the Red Army recaptured OMSK from white forces loyal to the provisional all-Russian government of Alexander Kolchak. He moved back to OMSK and married Belisova in January 1920. At the time of their marriage, Bros was 27 years old and Belisova was 15. In the autumn of 1920 he and his pregnant wife returned to his homeland, first by train to Narva, by ship to Stettin, then by train to Vienna, where they arrived on 20 September. In early October Bros returned home to Komrovic in what was then the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes to find that his mother had died and his father had moved to Jastrebersko near Zagreb. Sources differ over whether Bros joined the Communist Party while in Russia, but he stated that the first time he joined the party was in Zagreb after he returned to his homeland. <laughs> Interwar communist activity <laughs> <laughs> Communist agitator Upon his return home, Bros was unable to gain employment as a metalworker in Komrovic, so he and his wife moved briefly to Zagreb, where he worked as a waiter, and took part in a waiter's strike. He also joined the Communist Party of Yugoslavia CPY. The CPY's influence on the political life of Yugoslavia was growing rapidly. In the 1920 elections it won 59 seats and became the third strongest party. After the assassination of Milorad Draskovic, the Yugoslav Minister of the Interior, by a young communist named Elijah Alijajic on 2 August 1921, the CPY was declared illegal under the Yugoslav State Security Act of 1921. Due to his overt communist links, Bros was fired from his employment. He and his wife then moved to the village of Veliko Trojestvo where he worked as a mill mechanic. After the arrest of the CPY leadership in January 1922, Stevo Sabic took over control of its operations. Sabic contacted Bros who agreed to work illegally for the party, distributing leaflets and agitating among factory workers. In the contest of ideas between those that wanted to pursue moderate policies and those that advocated violent revolution, Bros sided with the latter. In 1924, Bros was elected to the CPY District Committee, but after he gave a speech at a comrade's Catholic funeral he was arrested when the priest complained. 
Paraded through the streets in chains, he was held for eight days and was eventually charged with creating a public disturbance. With the help of a Serbian Orthodox prosecutor who hated Catholics, Broz and his co-accused were acquitted. His brush with the law had marked him as a communist agitator, and his home was searched on an almost weekly basis. Since their arrival in Yugoslavia, Pelagia had lost three babies soon after their births, and one daughter, Zolotina, at the age of two. Broz felt the loss of Zolotina deeply. In 1924, Pelagia gave birth to a boy, Zarko, who survived. In mid-1925, Broz's employer died and the new mill owner gave him an ultimatum, give up his communist activities or lose his job. So, at the age of 33, Broz became a professional revolutionary. Topic. Professional revolutionary The CPY concentrated its revolutionary efforts on factory workers in the more industrialized areas of Croatia and Slovenia, encouraging strikes and similar action. In 1925, the now unemployed Bros moved to Kraljevica on the Adriatic coast, where he started working at a shipyard to further the aims of the CPY. While at Kraljevica he worked on Yugoslav torpedo boats and a pleasure yacht for the People's Radical Party politician, Milan Stojadinovic. Broz built up the trade union organization in the shipyards and was elected as a union representative. A year later he led a shipyard strike, and soon after was fired. In October 1926 he obtained work in a railway works in Smetarevska Polanka near Belgrade. In March 1927, he wrote an article complaining about the exploitation of workers in the factory, and after speaking up for a worker he was promptly sacked. Identified by the CPY as worthy of promotion, he was appointed secretary of the Zagreb branch of the Metal Workers' Union, and soon after of the whole Croatian branch of the union. In July 1927 Broz was arrested, along with six other workers, and imprisoned at nearby Ogulin. After being held without trial for some time, Broz went on a hunger strike until a date was set. The trial was held in secret and he was found guilty of being a member of the CPY. Sentenced to four months imprisonment, he was released from prison pending an appeal. On the orders of the CPY, Broz did not report to the court for the hearing of the appeal, instead going into hiding in Zagreb. Wearing dark spectacles and carrying forged papers, Broz posed as a middle-class technician in the engineering industry, working undercover to contact other CPY members and coordinate their infiltration of trade unions. In February 1928, Broz was one of 32 delegates to the conference of the Croatian branch of the CPY. During the conference, Broz condemned factions within the party. These included those that advocated a greater Serbia agenda within Yugoslavia, like the long-term CPY leader, the Serb Sima Markovic. Broz proposed that the executive committee of the Communist International purge the branch of factionalism, and was supported by a delegate sent from Moscow. After it was proposed that the entire central committee of the Croatian branch be dismissed, a new central committee was elected with Broz as its secretary. Markovic was subsequently expelled from the CPY at the 4th Congress of the Comintern, and the CPY adopted a policy of working for the breakup of Yugoslavia. Broz arranged to disrupt a meeting of the Social Democratic Party on May Day that year, and in a melee outside the venue, Broz was arrested by the police. They failed to identify him, charging him under his false name for a breach of the peace. He was imprisoned for 14 days and then released, returning to his previous activities. The police eventually tracked him down with the help of a police informer. He was ill-treated and held for three months before being tried in court in November 1928 for his illegal communist activities, which included allegations that the bombs that had been found at his address had been planted by the police. He was convicted and sentenced to five years imprisonment. Topic. Prison After his sentencing, his wife and son returned to Komrovic, where they were looked after by sympathetic locals, but then one day they suddenly left without explanation and returned to the Soviet Union. She fell in love with another man and Zarko grew up in institutions. After arriving at Lepoglava prison, Broz was employed in maintaining the electrical system, and chose as his assistant a middle-class Belgrade Jew, Moza Pijade, who had been given a 20-year sentence for his communist activities. Their work allowed Broz and Pijade to move around the prison, contacting and organizing other communist prisoners. During their time together in Lepoglava, Pijade became Broz's ideological mentor. 
After two and a half years at Lepoglava, Broz was accused of attempting to escape and was transferred to Maribor prison where he was held in solitary confinement for several months. After completing the full term of his sentence, he was released, only to be arrested outside the prison gates and taken to Ogulin to serve the four-month sentence he had avoided in 1927. He was finally released from prison on 16 March 1934, but even then he was subject to orders that required him to live in Kumrovic and report to the police daily. During his imprisonment, the political situation in Europe had changed significantly, with the rise of Adolf Hitler in Germany and the emergence of right-wing parties in France and neighbouring Austria. He returned to a warm welcome in Kumrovic, but did not stay for long. In early May, he received word from the CPY to return to his revolutionary activities, and left his home town for Zagreb, where he rejoined the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Croatia. The Croatian branch of the CPY was in disarray, a situation exacerbated by the escape of the Executive Committee of the CPY to Vienna in Austria, from which they were directing activities. Over the next six months, Broz travelled several times between Zagreb, Ljubljana, and Vienna, using false passports. In July 1934, he was blackmailed by a smuggler, but pressed on across the border, and was detained by the local Heimware, a paramilitary home guard. He used the Austrian accent he had developed during his war service to convince them that he was a wayward Austrian mountaineer, and they allowed him to proceed to Vienna. Once there, he contacted the general secretary of the CPY, Milan Gorkic, who sent him to Ljubljana to arrange a secret conference of the CPY in Slovenia. The conference was held at the Summer Palace of the Roman Catholic Bishop of Ljubljana, whose brother was a communist sympathizer. It was at this conference that Broz first met Edvard Kadelj, a young Slovene communist who had recently been released from prison. Broz and Kadelj subsequently became good friends, with Tito later regarding him as his most reliable deputy. As he was wanted by the police for failing to report to them in Kumrovic, Broz adopted various pseudonyms, including Rudy and Tito. He used the latter as a pen name when he wrote articles for party journals in 1934, and it stuck. He gave no reason for choosing the name, Tito, except that it was a common nickname for men from the district where he grew up. Within the commenter network, his nickname was, Walter. Topic. Flight from Yugoslavia During this time Tito wrote articles on the duties of imprisoned communists and on trade unions. He was in Ljubljana when King Alexander was assassinated by the Croatian nationalist Ustase organization in Marseille on 9 October 1934. In the crackdown on dissidents that followed his death, it was decided that Tito should leave Yugoslavia. He travelled to Vienna on a forged Czech passport where he joined Gorkic and the rest of the Politburo of the CPY. It was decided that the Austrian government was too hostile to communism, so the Politburo travelled to Brno in Czechoslovakia, and Tito accompanied them. On Christmas Day 1934, a secret meeting of the Central Committee of the CPY was held in Ljubljana, and Tito was elected as a member of the Politburo for the first time. The Politburo decided to send him to Moscow to report on the situation in Yugoslavia, and in early February 1935 he arrived there as full-time official of the Comintern. He lodged at the main Comintern residence, the Hotel Lux on Tverskaya Street, and was quickly in contact with Vladimir Kopic, one of the leading Yugoslavs with the Comintern. He was soon introduced to the main personalities in the organization. Tito was appointed to the Secretariat of the Balkan Section, responsible for Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania and Greece. Kadelj was also in Moscow, as was the Bulgarian communist leader Georgi Dimitrov. Tito lectured on trade unions to foreign communists, and attended a course on military tactics run by the Red Army, and occasionally attended the Bolshoi Theater. He attended as one of 510 delegates to the Seventh World Congress of the Comintern in July and August 1935, where he briefly saw Joseph Stalin for the first time. After the Congress, he toured the Soviet Union, then returned to Moscow to continue his work. He contacted Polka and Zarko, but soon fell in love with an Austrian woman who worked at the Hotel Lux, Johanna Koenig, known within communist ranks as Lucia Bauer. When she became aware of this liaison, Polka divorced Tito in April 1936. 
Tito married Bauer on 13 October of that year. After the World Congress, Tito worked to promote the new Comintern line on Yugoslavia, which was that it would no longer work to break up the country, and would instead defend the integrity of Yugoslavia against Nazism and fascism. From a distance, Tito also worked to organize strikes at the shipyards at Kraljevica and the coal mines at Turbavlia near Ljubljana. He tried to convince the Comintern that it would be better if the party leadership was located inside Yugoslavia. A compromise was arrived at, where Tito and others would work inside the country and Gorkic and the Politburo would continue to work from abroad. Gorkic and the Politburo relocated to Paris, while Tito began to travel between Moscow, Paris and Zagreb in 1936 and 1937, using false passports. In 1936, his father died. Tito returned to Moscow in August 1936, soon after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. At the time, the Great Purge was underway, and foreign communists like Tito and his Yugoslav compatriots were particularly vulnerable. Despite a laudatory report written by Tito about the veteran Yugoslav communist Filip Filipovic, he was arrested and shot by the Soviet secret police, the NKVD. However, before the purge really began to erode the ranks of the Yugoslav communists in Moscow, Tito was sent back to Yugoslavia with a new mission, to recruit volunteers for the international brigades being raised to fight on the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. Traveling via Vienna, he reached the coastal port city of Split in December 1936. According to the Croatian historian Ivo Banak, the reason Tito was sent back to Yugoslavia by the Comintern was in order to purge the CPY. An initial attempt to send 500 volunteers to Spain by ship failed utterly, with nearly all the communist volunteers being arrested and imprisoned. Tito then travelled to Paris, where he arranged the travel of volunteers to France under the cover of attending the Paris exhibition. Once in France, the volunteers simply crossed the Pyrenees to Spain. In all, he sent 1,192 men to fight in the war, but only 330 came from Yugoslavia, the rest being expatriates in France, Belgium, the US and Canada. Less than half were communists, and the rest were social democrats and anti-fascists of various hues. Of the total, 671 were killed in the fighting and another 300 were wounded. Tito himself never went to Spain, despite later claims that he had. Between May and August 1937, Tito traveled several times between Paris and Zagreb organizing the movement of volunteers and creating a separate Communist Party of Croatia. The new party was inaugurated at a conference at Samobor on the outskirts of Zagreb on 1–2 August 1937. Topic. General Secretary of the CPY In June 1937, Gorkic was summoned to Moscow, where he was arrested, and after months of NKVD interrogation, he was shot. According to Banak, Gorkic was killed on Stalin's orders. West concludes that despite being in competition with men like Gorkic for the leadership of the CPY, it was not in Tito's character to have innocent people sent to their deaths. Tito then received a message from the Politburo of the CPY to join them in Paris. In August 1937 he became acting General Secretary of the CPY. He later explained that he survived the purge by staying out of Spain where the NKVD was active, and also by avoiding visiting the Soviet Union as much as possible. When first appointed as General Secretary, he avoided traveling to Moscow by insisting that he needed to deal with some indiscipline in the CPY in Paris. He also promoted the idea that the upper echelons of the CPY should be sharing the dangers of underground resistance within the country. He developed a new, younger leadership team that was loyal to him, including the Slovene Kadelj, the Serb, Aleksandr Rankovic, and the Montenegrin, Milovan Dillas. In December 1937, Tito arranged for a demonstration to greet the French foreign minister when he visited Belgrade, expressing solidarity with the French against Nazi Germany. The protest march numbered 30,000 and turned into a protest against the neutrality policy of the Stoyadinovic government. It was eventually broken up by the police. In March 1938 Tito returned to Yugoslavia from Paris. Hearing a rumor that his opponents within the CPY had tipped off the police, he traveled to Belgrade rather than Zagreb and used a different passport. While in Belgrade he stayed with a young intellectual, Vladimir Dediher, who was a friend of Dilla's. Arriving in Yugoslavia a few days ahead of the Anschluss between Nazi Germany and Austria, he made an appeal condemning it, in which the CPY was joined by the Social Democrats and trade unions. 
In June, Tito wrote to the Comintern suggesting that he should visit Moscow. He waited in Paris for two months for his Soviet visa before traveling to Moscow via Copenhagen. He arrived in Moscow on 24 August. On arrival in Moscow, he found that all Yugoslav communists were under suspicion. Nearly all the most prominent leaders of the CPY were arrested by the NKVD and executed, including over 20 members of the Central Committee. Both his ex-wife Polka and his wife Koenig, Bauer were arrested as imperialist spies. Although they were both eventually released, Polka after 27 months in prison. Tito therefore needed to make arrangements for the care of Zarko, who was 14. He placed him a boarding school outside Kharkiv, then at a school at Penza, but he ran away twice and was eventually taken in by a friend's mother. In 1941, Zarko joined the Red Army to fight the invading Germans. Some of Tito's critics argue that his survival indicates he must have denounced his comrades as Trotskyists. He was asked for information on a number of his fellow Yugoslav communists, but according to his own statements and published documents, he never denounced anyone, usually saying he did not know them. In one case he was asked about the Croatian communist leader Horvodin, but wrote ambiguously, saying that he did not know whether he was a Trotskyist. Nevertheless, Horvodin was not heard of again. While in Moscow, he was given the task of assisting Kopic to translate the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolsheviks into Serbo-Croatian, but they had only got to the second chapter when Kopic II was arrested and executed. He worked on with a fellow surviving Yugoslav communist, but a Yugoslav communist of German ethnicity reported an inaccurate translation of a passage and claimed it showed Tito was a Trotskyist. Other influential communists vouched for him, and he was exonerated. He was denounced by a second Yugoslav communist, but the action backfired and his accuser was arrested. Several factors were at play in his survival, working class origins, lack of interest in intellectual arguments about socialism, attractive personality and capacity for making influential friends. While Tito was avoiding arrest in Moscow, Germany was placing pressure on Czechoslovakia to cede the Sudetenland. In response to this threat, Tito organized for a call for Yugoslav volunteers to fight for Czechoslovakia, and thousands of volunteers came to the Czechoslovak embassy in Belgrade to offer their services. Despite the eventual Munich agreement and Czechoslovak acceptance of the annexation and the fact that the volunteers were turned away, Tito claimed credit for the Yugoslav response, which worked in his favor. By this stage, Tito was well aware of the realities in the Soviet Union, later stating that he witnessed a great many injustices," but was too heavily invested in communism and too loyal to the Soviet Union to step back at this point. Tito's appointment as General Secretary of the CPY was formally ratified by the Comintern on 5 January 1939. He was appointed to the committee and started to appoint allies to him, among them Edvard Kodelj, Milovan Dillas, Alexander Rankovic and Boris Kidrick. World War II Topic. Resistance in Yugoslavia On 6 April 1941, German forces, with Hungarian and Italian assistance, launched an invasion of Yugoslavia. On 10 April 1941, Slavko Kvaternik proclaimed the independent state of Croatia, and Tito responded by forming a military committee within the Central Committee of the Yugoslav Communist Party. Attacked from all sides, the armed forces of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia quickly crumbled. On 17 April 1941, after King Peter II and other members of the government fled the country, the remaining representatives of the government and military met with the German officials in Belgrade. They quickly agreed to end military resistance. On 1 May 1941, Tito issued a pamphlet calling on the people to unite in a battle against the occupation. On 27 June 1941, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia appointed Tito commander-in-chief of all Project National Liberation Military Forces. On 1 July 1941, the Comintern sent precise instructions calling for immediate action. Despite conflicts with the rival monarchic Chetnik movement, Tito's partisans succeeded in liberating territory, notably the Republic of Uzis. During this period, Tito held talks with Chetnik leader Draza Mihailovic on 19 September and 27 October 1941. 
It is said that Tito ordered his forces to assist escaping Jews, and that more than 2,000 Jews fought directly for Tito. On 21 December 1941, the partisans created the 1st Proletarian Brigade commanded by Koka Popovic and on 1 March 1942, Tito created the 2nd Proletarian Brigade. In liberated territories, the partisans organized people's committees to act as civilian government. The Anti-Fascist Council of National Liberation of Yugoslavia convened in Bihać on 26–27 November 1942 and in Jachi on 29 November 1943. In the two sessions, the resistance representatives established the basis for post-war organization of the country, deciding on a federation of the Yugoslav nations. In Jachi, a 67-member presidency was elected and established a nine-member National Committee of Liberation five communist members as a de facto provisional government. Tito was named president of the National Committee of Liberation, with the growing possibility of an Allied invasion in the Balkans, the Axis began to divert more resources to the destruction of the partisans' main force and its high command. This meant, among other things, a concerted German effort to capture Josip Broz Tito personally. On 25 May 1944, he managed to evade the Germans after the raid on Dravar Operation Rosselsprung, an airborne assault outside his Dravar headquarters in Bosnia. After the partisans managed to endure and avoid these intense Axis attacks between January and June 1943, and the extent of Chetnik collaboration became evident, Allied leaders switched their support from Draza Mihailovic to Tito. King Peter II, American President Franklin Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill joined Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin in officially recognizing Tito and the partisans at the Tehran Conference. This resulted in Allied aid being parachuted behind Axis lines to assist the partisans. On 17 June 1944 on the Dalmatian island of Vis, the Treaty of Vis was signed in an attempt to merge Tito's government the AVNOJ with the government in exile of King Peter II. The Balkan Air Force was formed in June 1944 to control operations that were mainly aimed at aiding his forces. On the 12th of September 1944, King Peter II called on all Yugoslavs to come together under Tito's leadership and stated that those who did not were traitors. By which time Tito was recognized by all allied authorities including the government in exile as the prime minister of Yugoslavia in addition to commander in chief of the Yugoslav forces. On 28 September 1944, the Telegraph Agency of the Soviet Union TASS, reported that Tito signed an agreement with the Soviet Union allowing temporary entry of Soviet troops into Yugoslav territory which allowed the Red Army to assist in operations in the northeastern areas of Yugoslavia. With their strategic right flank secured by the Allied advance, the partisans prepared and executed a massive general offensive which succeeded in breaking through German lines and forcing a retreat beyond Yugoslav borders. After the partisan victory and the end of hostilities in Europe, all external forces were ordered off Yugoslav territory. In the final days of World War II in Yugoslavia, units of the partisans were responsible for atrocities after the repatriations of Bleiburg, and accusations of culpability were later raised at the Yugoslav leadership under Tito. At the time, according to some authors, Josip Broz Tito repeatedly issued calls for surrender to the retreating column, offering amnesty and attempting to avoid a disorderly surrender. On 14 May he dispatched a telegram to the Supreme Headquarters Slovene Partisan Army prohibiting the execution of prisoners of war and commanding the transfer of the possible suspects to a military court. <laughs> Aftermath On 7 March 1945, the Provisional Government of the Democratic Federal Yugoslavia Demokratska Federativna Jugoslavia, DFY, was assembled in Belgrade by Josip Broz Tito, while the provisional name allowed for either a republic or monarchy. This government was headed by Tito as Provisional Yugoslav Prime Minister and included representatives from the royalist government in exile, among others Ivan Subasic. In accordance with the agreement between resistance leaders and the government in exile, post-war elections were held to determine the form of government. In November 1945, Tito's pro-Republican People's Front, led by the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, won the elections with an overwhelming majority, the vote having been boycotted by monarchists. During the period, Tito evidently enjoyed massive popular support due to being generally viewed by the populace as the liberator of Yugoslavia. 
The Yugoslav administration in the immediate post-war period managed to unite a country that had been severely affected by ultra-nationalist upheavals and war devastation, while successfully suppressing the nationalist sentiments of the various nations in favor of tolerance, and the common Yugoslav goal. After the overwhelming electoral victory, Tito was confirmed as the Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the DFY. The country was soon renamed the Federal People's Republic of Yugoslavia FPRY, later finally renamed into Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, SFRY. On 29 November 1945, King Peter II was formally deposed by the Yugoslav Constituent Assembly. The Assembly drafted a new Republican constitution soon afterwards. Yugoslavia organized the Yugoslav People's Army or JNA from the partisan movement and became the fourth strongest army in Europe at the time. The State Security Administration was also formed as the new secret police, along with a security agency, the Department of People's Security Army Yugoslav intelligence was charged with imprisoning and bringing to trial large numbers of Nazi collaborators. Controversially, this included Catholic clergymen due to the widespread involvement of Croatian Catholic clergy with the Ustasa regime. Draza Mihailović was found guilty of collaboration, high treason, and war crimes and was subsequently executed by firing squad in July 1946. Prime Minister Josip Broz Tito met with the President of the Bishops' Conference of Yugoslavia, Aloysius Stepanak on 4 June 1945, two days after his release from imprisonment. The two could not reach an agreement on the state of the Catholic Church. Under Stepanak's leadership, the Bishops' Conference released a letter condemning alleged partisan war crimes in September, 1945. The following year Stepanak was arrested and put on trial. In October 1946, in its first special session for 75 years, the Vatican excommunicated Tito and the Yugoslav government for sentencing Stepanak to 16 years in prison on charges of assisting Ustase terror and of supporting forced conversions of Serbs to Catholicism. Stepanak received preferential treatment in recognition of his status and the sentence was soon shortened and reduced to house arrest, with the option of emigration open to the archbishop. At the conclusion of the Informbureau period, Reforms rendered Yugoslavia considerably more religiously liberal than the Eastern Bloc states. In the first post-war years Tito was widely considered a communist leader very loyal to Moscow, indeed, he was often viewed as second only to Stalin in the Eastern Bloc. In fact, Stalin and Tito had an uneasy alliance from the start, with Stalin considering Tito too independent. During the immediate post-war period Tito's Yugoslavia had a strong commitment to orthodox Marxist ideas. Harsh repressive measures against dissidents were common, including arrests, show trials, forced collectivization, suppression of churches and religion. <inaudible> Presidency <inaudible> Tito-Stalin split Unlike other new communist states in East Central Europe, Yugoslavia liberated itself from Axis domination with limited direct support from the Red Army. Tito's leading role in liberating Yugoslavia not only greatly strengthened his position in his party and among the Yugoslav people, but also caused him to be more insistent that Yugoslavia had more room to follow its own interests than other bloc leaders who had more reasons to recognize Soviet efforts in helping them liberate their own countries from Axis control. Although Tito was formally an ally of Stalin after World War II, the Soviets had set up a spy ring in the Yugoslav party as early as 1945, giving way to an uneasy alliance. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, there occurred several armed incidents between Yugoslavia and the Western Allies. Following the war, Yugoslavia acquired the Italian territory of Istria as well as the cities of Zadar and Rijeka. Yugoslav leadership was looking to incorporate Trieste into the country as well, which was opposed by the Western Allies. This led to several armed incidents, notably attacks by Yugoslav fighter planes on U.S. transport aircraft, causing bitter criticism from the West. From 1945 to 1948, at least four U.S. aircraft were shot down. Stalin was opposed to these provocations, as he felt the USSR unready to face the West in open war so soon after the losses of World War II and at the time when US had operational nuclear weapons whereas the USSR had yet to conduct its first test. 
In addition, Tito was openly supportive of the communist side in the Greek Civil War, while Stalin kept his distance, having agreed with Churchill not to pursue Soviet interests there, although he did support the Greek communist struggle politically, as demonstrated in several assemblies of the UN Security Council. In 1948, motivated by the desire to create a strong independent economy, Tito modeled his economic development plan independently from Moscow, which resulted in a diplomatic escalation followed by a bitter exchange of letters in which Tito wrote that, "...we study and take as an example the Soviet system," but develop it a different form. The Soviet answer on 4 May admonished Tito and the Communist Party of Yugoslavia CPY for failing to admit and correct its mistakes, and went on to accuse them of being too proud of their successes against the Germans, maintaining that the Red Army had saved them from destruction. Tito's response on 17 May suggested that the matter be settled at the meeting of the Cominform to be held that June. However, Tito did not attend the second meeting of the Cominform, fearing that Yugoslavia was to be openly attacked. In 1949 the crisis nearly escalated into an armed conflict, as Hungarian and Soviet forces were massing on the northern Yugoslav frontier. On 28 June, the other member countries expelled Yugoslavia, citing «nationalist elements» that had «managed in the course of the past five or six months to reach a dominant position in the leadership» of the CPY. The assumption in Moscow was that once it was known that he had lost Soviet approval, Tito would collapse, I will shake my little finger and there will be no more Tito, Stalin remarked. The expulsion effectively banished Yugoslavia from the International Association of Socialist States, while other socialist states of Eastern Europe subsequently underwent purges of alleged Titoists. Stalin took the matter personally and arranged several assassination attempts on Tito, none of which succeeded. In a correspondence between the two leaders, Tito openly wrote, Stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured five of them, one of them with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send one to Moscow, and I won't have to send a second. One significant consequence of the tension arising between Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, was Tito's decision to begin a large-scale repression against any real or alleged opponent of his own view of Yugoslavia. This repression was not limited to known and alleged Stalinists, but included also members of the Communist Party or anyone exhibiting sympathy towards the Soviet Union. Prominent partisans, such as Vlado Dapchevic and Dragoljub Mikhanovic, were victims of this period of strong repression which lasted until 1956 and was marked by significant violations of human rights. Tens of thousands of political opponents served in forced labor camps, such as Goli Otok, and hundreds died. Tito's estrangement from the USSR enabled Yugoslavia to obtain U.S. aid via the Economic Cooperation Administration ECA, the same U.S. aid institution which administered the Marshall Plan. Still, he did not agree to align with the West, which was a common consequence of accepting American aid at the time. After Stalin's death in 1953, relations with the USSR were relaxed, and Tito began to receive aid as well from the Comic-Con. In this way, Tito played East-West antagonism to his advantage. Instead of choosing sides, he was instrumental in kick-starting the non-aligned movement, which would function as a third way for countries interested in staying outside of the East-West divide. The event was significant not only for Yugoslavia and Tito, but also for the global development of socialism, since it was the first major split between communist states, casting doubt on Comintern's claims for socialism to be a unified force that would eventually control the whole world, as Tito became the first and the only successful socialist leader to defy Stalin's leadership in the common form. This rift with the Soviet Union brought Tito much international recognition, but also triggered a period of instability often referred to as the Informbureau period. Tito's form of communism was labeled Titoism by Moscow, which encouraged purges against suspected Titoites throughout the Eastern Bloc. On 26 June 1950, the National Assembly supported a crucial bill written by Milovan Dillas and Tito regarding self-management a type of cooperative independent socialist experiment that introduced profit sharing and workplace democracy in previously state-run enterprises which then became the direct social ownership of the employees on the 13th of january 1953 they established that the law on self-management was the basis of the entire social order in yugoslavia Tito also succeeded Ivan Ribar as the president of Yugoslavia on 14 January 1953. 
After Stalin's death, Tito rejected the USSR's invitation for a visit to discuss normalization of relations between the two nations. Nikita Khrushchev and Nikolai Bulganin visited Tito in Belgrade in 1955 and apologized for wrongdoings by Stalin's administration. Tito visited the USSR in 1956, which signaled to the world that animosity between Yugoslavia and USSR was easing. However, the relationship would reach another low in the late 1960s. The Tito Stalin split had large ramifications for countries outside the USSR and Yugoslavia. It has, for example, been given as one of the reasons for the Slansky trial in Czechoslovakia, in which 14 high level communist officials were purged, with 11 of them being executed. Stalin put pressure on Czechoslovakia to conduct purges in order to discourage the spread of the idea of a national path to socialism, which Tito espoused. Non-alignment Under Tito's leadership, Yugoslavia became a founding member of the non-aligned movement. In 1961, Tito co-founded the movement with Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser, India's Jawaharlal Nehru, Indonesia's Sukarno and Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah, in an action called the Initiative of Five Tito, Nehru, Nasser, Sukarno, Nkrumah, thus establishing strong ties with third world countries. This move did much to improve Yugoslavia's diplomatic position. On 1 September 1961, Josip Broz Tito became the first Secretary General of the Non-Aligned Movement. Tito's foreign policy led to relationships with a variety of governments, such as exchanging visits 1954 and 1956 with Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, where a street was named in his honor. Tito was notable for pursuing a foreign policy of neutrality during the Cold War and for establishing close ties with developing countries. Tito's strong belief in self-determination caused the 1948 rift with Stalin and consequently, the Eastern Bloc. His public speeches often reiterated that policy of neutrality and cooperation with all countries would be natural as long as these countries did not use their influence to pressure Yugoslavia to take sides. Relations with the United States and Western European nations were generally cordial. Yugoslavia had a liberal travel policy permitting foreigners to freely travel through the country and its citizens to travel worldwide, whereas it was limited by most communist countries. A number of Yugoslav citizens worked throughout Western Europe. Tito met many world leaders during his rule, such as Soviet rulers Joseph Stalin, Nikita Khrushchev and Leonid Brezhnev, Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser, Indian politicians Jawaharlal Nehru and Indira Gandhi, British Prime Ministers Winston Churchill, James Callaghan and Margaret Thatcher, U.S. Presidents Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, other political leaders, dignitaries and heads of state that Tito met at least once in his lifetime included Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, Yasser Arafat, Willie Brandt, Helmut Schmidt, Georges Pompidou, Queen Elizabeth II, Hua Guofeng, Kim Il-sung, Sukarno, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Suharto, Idi Amin, Haile Selassie, Kenneth Konda, Gaddafi, Eric Honecker, Nikolai Ceausescu, Janos Kadar and Yurho Kekkonen. He also met numerous celebrities. In 1953, Tito traveled to Britain for a state visit and met with Winston Churchill. He also toured Cambridge and visited the University Library. Tito visited India from the 22nd of December 1954 through the 8th of January 1955. After his return, he removed many restrictions on churches and spiritual institutions in Yugoslavia. Tito also developed warm relations with Burma under UNU, traveling to the country in 1955 and again in 1959, though he didn't receive the same treatment in 1959 from the new leader, Ne Win. Because of its neutrality, Yugoslavia would often be rare among communist countries to have diplomatic relations with right-wing, anti-communist governments. For example, Yugoslavia was the only communist country allowed to have an embassy in Alfredo Stroessner's Paraguay. One notable exception to Yugoslavia's neutral stance toward anti-communist countries was Chile under Pinochet. Yugoslavia was one of many countries which severed diplomatic relations with Chile after Salvador Allende was overthrown. Yugoslavia also provided military aid and arms supplies to staunchly anti-communist regimes such as that of Guatemala under Kiel Eugenio Lagarid Garcia. Reforms 
On 7 April 1963, the country changed its official name to the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Reforms encouraged private enterprise and greatly relaxed restrictions on religious expression. Tito subsequently went on a tour of the Americas. In Chile, two government ministers resigned over his visit to that country. In the autumn of 1960 Tito met President Dwight D. Eisenhower at the United Nations General Assembly meeting. Tito and Eisenhower discussed a range of issues from arms control to economic development. When Eisenhower remarked that Yugoslavia's neutralism was neutral on his side, Tito replied that neutralism did not imply passivity but meant not taking sides. In 1966 an agreement with the Vatican, fostered in part by the death in 1960 of anti-communist Archbishop of Zagreb Aloysius Stepanak and shifts in the Church's approach to resisting communism originating in the Second Vatican Council, accorded new freedom to the Yugoslav Roman Catholic Church, particularly to catechize and open seminaries. The agreement also eased tensions, which had prevented the naming of new bishops in Yugoslavia since 1945. Tito's new socialism met opposition from traditional communists culminating in conspiracy headed by Alexander Rankovic. In the same year Tito declared that communists must henceforth chart Yugoslavia's course by the force of their arguments implying an abandonment of Leninist orthodoxy and development of liberal communism. The State Security Administration UDBA saw its power scaled back and its staff reduced to 5,000. On 1 January 1967, Yugoslavia was the first communist country to open its borders to all foreign visitors and abolish visa requirements. In the same year Tito became active in promoting a peaceful resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict. His plan called for Arabs to recognize the state of Israel in exchange for territories Israel gained. In 1968, Tito offered Czechoslovak leader Alexander Dubček to fly to Prague on three hours' notice if Dubček needed help in facing down the Soviets. In April 1969, Tito removed generals Ivan Gozniak and Raid Hamovic in the aftermath of the invasion of Czechoslovakia due to the unpreparedness of the Yugoslav army to respond to a similar invasion of Yugoslavia. In 1971, Tito was re elected as president of Yugoslavia by the Federal Assembly for the sixth time. In his speech before the Federal Assembly, he introduced 20 sweeping constitutional amendments that would provide an updated framework on which the country would be based. The amendments provided for a collective presidency, a 22-member body consisting of elected representatives from six republics and two autonomous provinces. The body would have a single chairman of the presidency and chairmanship would rotate among six republics. When the Federal Assembly fails to agree on legislation, the collective presidency would have the power to rule by decree. Amendments also provided for stronger cabinet with considerable power to initiate and pursue legislation independently from the Communist Party. Jamal Bejidik was chosen as the premier. The new amendments aimed to decentralize the country by granting greater autonomy to republics and provinces. The federal government would retain authority only over foreign affairs, defense, internal security, monetary affairs, free trade within Yugoslavia, and development loans to poorer regions. Control of education, healthcare, and housing would be exercised entirely by the governments of the republics and the autonomous provinces. Tito's greatest strength, in the eyes of the Western communists, had been in suppressing nationalist insurrections and maintaining unity throughout the country. It was Tito's call for unity, and related methods, that held together the people of Yugoslavia. This ability was put to a test several times during his reign, notably during the Croatian Spring, also referred as the Masovni Pokret, Maspok, meaning mass movement, when the government suppressed both public demonstrations and dissenting opinions within the Communist Party. Despite this suppression, much of Maspok's demands were later realized with the new constitution, heavily backed by Tito himself against opposition from the Serbian branch of the party. On 16 May 1974, the new constitution was passed, and the aging Tito was named President for Life, a status which he would enjoy for five years. Tito's visits to the United States avoided most of the Northeast due to large minorities of Yugoslav emigrants bitter about communism in Yugoslavia. Security for the state visits was usually high to keep him away from protesters, who would frequently burn the Yugoslav flag. During a visit to the United Nations in the late 1970s emigrants shouted, Tito murderer, outside his New York hotel, for which he protested to United States authorities. Topic. Evaluation 
Dominic McGoldrick writes that as the head of a highly centralized and oppressive regime, Tito wielded tremendous power in Yugoslavia, with his authoritarian rule administered through an elaborate bureaucracy which routinely suppressed human rights. The main victims of this repression were during the first years known and alleged Stalinists, such as Dragoslav Mihailovic and Dragoljub Mikhanovic, but during the following years even some of the most prominent among Tito's collaborators were arrested. On 19 November 1956 Milovan Dillas, perhaps the closest of Tito's collaborator and widely regarded as Tito's possible successor, was arrested because of his criticism against Tito's regime. The repression did not exclude intellectuals and writers, such as Venko Murkowski who was arrested and sent to jail in January 1956 for writing poems considered anti-Titoist. Even if after the reforms of 1961 Tito's presidency had become comparatively more liberal than other communist regimes, the Communist Party continued to alternate between liberalism and repression. Yugoslavia managed to remain independent from the Soviet Union and its brand of socialism was in many ways the envy of Eastern Europe, but Tito's Yugoslavia remained a tightly controlled police state. According to David Mates, outside the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia had more political prisoners than all of the rest of Eastern Europe combined. Tito's secret police was modeled on the Soviet KGB, its members were ever present and often acted extrajudicially, with victims including middle class intellectuals, liberals, and Democrats. More generally, even if Yugoslavia had been signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, scant regard was paid to some of its provisions. Tito's Yugoslavia was based on respect for nationality, although Tito ruthlessly purged any flowerings of nationalism that threatened the Yugoslav Federation. However, the contrast between the deference given to some ethnic groups and the severe repression of others was sharp. Yugoslav law guaranteed nationalities to use their language, but for ethnic Albanians the assertion of ethnic identity was severely limited. Almost half of the political prisoners in Yugoslavia were ethnic Albanians imprisoned for asserting their ethnic identity. Yugoslavia's post war development under Tito was significant but inferior to that of any European country adopting more market based models and just similar to the economic development showed by countries adopting similar systems to that of Yugoslavia, such as Hungary or Bulgaria. From an economic perspective, the model implemented by Tito relied on debt and was not built on a stable foundation. By 1970 debt was not any more contracted to finance investment, but to cover current expenses. The country ran into a deep economic crisis, marked by significant unemployment and inflation. The sign that the robustness of the Yugoslav economy was an illusion appeared immediately after Tito's death, when the country could not repay the massive debt accumulated between 1961 and 1980. Between 1961 and 1980, external debt of Yugoslavia increased exponentially at the unsustainable pace of over 17% per year. The structure of the economy had formed in such a way that the future survival of the economy relied on the exclusive condition of future enlargement of the debt. Declassified documents from the CIA state that already in 1967 it was clear that Tito's economic model had achieved growth of the gross national product at the cost of excessive and frequently unwise industrial investment and chronic deficit in the nation's balance of payment. When Tito died Rory O. Brade, the then president of Sinn Féin stated in Infoblack that the death of President Tito deprives the world of a dedicated socialist and staunch internationalist. Tito instituted a federal democratic and socialist regime based on shared sovereignty and pioneered an economic and political system founded on workers' control and the principles of decentralized self management. He had an enlightened and progressive internationalist policy of non alignment and defiance of both major power blocs. Orson Welles once called him, "...the greatest man in the world today". <inaudible> Final years After the constitutional changes of 1974, Tito began reducing his role in the day-to-day -day running of the state. He continued to travel abroad and receive foreign visitors, going to Beijing in 1977 and reconciling with a Chinese leadership that had once branded him a revisionist. In turn, Chairman Hua Guofeng visited Yugoslavia in 1979. In 1978, Tito traveled to the U.S. During the visit strict security was imposed in Washington, D.C. owing to protests by anti-communist Croat, Serb and Albanian groups. 
Tito became increasingly ill over the course of 1979. During this time Vila Serna was built for his use near Morovic in the event of his recovery. On 7 January and again on of January 1980, Tito was admitted to the medical center in Ljubljana, the capital city of the senior Slovenia, with circulation problems in his legs. His left leg was amputated soon afterward due to arterial blockages and he died of gangrene at the medical center Ljubljana on 4 May 1980, three days short of his 88th birthday. His funeral drew many world statesmen, based on the number of attending politicians and state delegations. At the time, it was the largest state funeral in history. This concentration of dignitaries would be unmatched until the funeral of Pope John Paul II in 2005 and the memorial service of Nelson Mandela in 2013. Those who attended included four kings, 31 presidents, six princes, 22 prime ministers, and 47 ministers of foreign affairs. They came from both sides of the Cold War, from 128 different countries out of 154 UN members at the time. Reporting on his death, the New York Times commented, Tito sought to improve life. Unlike others who rose to power on the communist wave after World War II, Tito did not long demand that his people suffer for a distant vision of a better life. After an initial Soviet-influenced bleak period, Tito moved toward radical improvement of life in the country. Yugoslavia gradually became a bright spot amid the general grayness of Eastern Europe, The New York Times, 5 May 1980. Tito was interred in a mausoleum in Belgrade, which forms part of a memorial complex in the grounds of the Museum of Yugoslav History formerly called Museum the 25th of May and Museum of the Revolution. The actual mausoleum is called House of Flowers and numerous people visit the place as a shrine to better times. The museum keeps the gifts Tito received during his presidency. The collection also includes original prints of Los Caprichos by Francisco Goya, and many others. The government of Serbia planned to merge it into the Museum of the History of Serbia. <laughs> Legacy During his life and especially in the first year after his death, several places were named after Tito. Several of these places have since returned to their original names, such as Podgorica, formerly Titograd though Podgorica's international airport is still identified by the code TGD, and Uzis, formerly known as Titovo Uzis, which reverted to its original name in 1992. Streets in Belgrade, the capital, have all reverted to their original pre-World War II and pre-communist names as well. In 2004, Anton Augustinchich's statue of Broz in his birthplace of Kumrovic was decapitated in an explosion. It was subsequently repaired. Twice in 2008, protests took place in what was then Zagreb's Marshal Tito Square today the Republic of Croatia Square, organized by a group called Circle for the Square Krug za TRG, with an aim to force the city government to rename it to its previous name, while a counter-protest by Citizens Initiative Against Eustacism Gradanska Initiativa Protiv Eustastva accused the Circle for the Square of historical revisionism and neo-fascism. Croatian President Stjepan Mesic criticized the demonstration to change the name. In the Croatian coastal city of Apatija the main street, also its longest street still bears the name of Marshal Tito, as do streets in numerous towns in Serbia, mostly in the country's north. One of the main streets in downtown Sarajevo is called Marshal Tito Street, and Tito's statue in a park in front of the university campus X. JNA Barak. Marshal Tito. In Marijan Dvor is a place where Bosnians and Sarajevans still today commemorate and pay tribute to Tito image on the right. The largest Tito monument in the world, about 10 meters 33 feet high, is located at Tito Square Slovene, Titov Trg, the central square in Velenje, Slovenia. One of the main bridges in Slovenia's second largest city of Maribor is Tito Bridge Titov Most. The central square in Koper, the largest Slovenian port city, is as well named Tito Square. The main belt asteroid 1550 Tito, discovered by Serbian astronomer Milorad B. Protik at Belgrade Observatory in 1937, was named in his honor. Every year a Brotherhood and Unity relay race is organized in Montenegro, Macedonia, and Serbia, which ends at the House of Flowers in Belgrade on 25 May, the final resting place of Tito. At the same time, runners in Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina set off for Kumrovic, Tito's birthplace in northern Croatia. 
The relay is a left over from the relay of youth from Yugoslav times, when young people made a similar yearly trek on foot through Yugoslavia that ended in Belgrade with a massive celebration. In 1992, Tito and Me, Serbian, Tito i ja, Tito i ja, a 1992 Yugoslav comedy film by Serbian director Goran Markovic, was released. In the years following the dissolution of Yugoslavia, some historians stated that human rights were suppressed in Yugoslavia under Tito, particularly in the first decade up until the Tito-Stalin split. On 4 October 2011, the Slovenian Constitutional Court found a 2009 naming of a street in Ljubljana after Tito to be unconstitutional. While several public areas in Slovenia named during the Yugoslav period do already bear Tito's name, on the issue of renaming an additional street the court ruled that the name Tito does not only symbolize the liberation of the territory of present-day Slovenia from fascist occupation in World War II, as claimed by the other party in the case, but also grave violations of human rights and basic freedoms, especially in the decade following World War II. The court, however, explicitly made it clear that the purpose of the review was, "...not a verdict on Tito as a figure or on his concrete actions, as well as not a historical weighing of facts and circumstances." Slovenia has several streets and squares named after Tito, notably Tito Square in Velenje, incorporating a 10-meter statue. Tito has also been named as responsible for systematic eradication of the ethnic German Danube Swabian population in Vojvodina by expulsions and mass executions following the collapse of the German occupation of Yugoslavia at the end of World War II, in contrast to his inclusive attitude towards other Yugoslav nationalities. <laughs> Family and personal life Tito carried on numerous affairs and was married several times. In 1918 he was brought to OMSK, Russia, as a prisoner of war. There he met Pelagia Belisova who was then 14, he married her a year later, and she moved with him to Yugoslavia. Pelagia bore him five children but only their son Zarko Leon born the 4th of February 1924 survived. When Tito was jailed in 1928, she returned to Russia. After the divorce in 1936 she later remarried. In 1936, when Tito stayed at the Hotel Lux in Moscow, he met the Austrian Lucia Bauer. They married in October 1936, but the records of this marriage were later erased. His next relationship was with Herta Haas, whom he married in 1940. Bros left for Belgrade after the April War, leaving Haas pregnant. In May 1941, she gave birth to their son, Alexander. Miso. Bros. All throughout his relationship with Haas, Tito had maintained a promiscuous life and had a parallel relationship with Dvoryanka Paunovic, who, under the codename Z. Denka, served as a courier in the resistance and subsequently became his personal secretary. Haas and Tito suddenly parted company in 1943 in Jachi during the second meeting of AVNOJ after she reportedly walked in on him and Dvoryanka. The last time Haas saw Bros was in 1946. Dvoryanka died of tuberculosis in 1946 and Tito insisted that she be buried in the backyard of the Belly Dvor, his Belgrade residence. His best known wife was Javanka Bros. Tito was just shy of his 59th birthday, while she was 27, when they finally married in April 1952, with state security chief Alexander Rankovic as the best man. Their eventual marriage came about somewhat unexpectedly since Tito actually rejected her some years earlier when his confidant Ivan Krajicic brought her in originally. At that time, she was in her early twenties and Tito, objecting to her energetic personality, opted for the more mature opera singer Zinka Kunc instead. Not one to be discouraged easily, Javanka continued working at Belly Dvor, where she managed the staff and eventually got another chance after Tito's strange relationship with Zinka failed. Their relationship was not a happy one, however. It had gone through many, often public, ups and downs with episodes of infidelities and even allegations of preparation for a coup d'état by the latter pair. Certain unofficial reports suggest Tito and Javanka even formally divorced in the late 1970s, shortly before his death. However, during Tito's funeral she was officially present as his wife, and later claimed rights for inheritance. The couple did not have any children. 
Tito's grandchildren include Sasa Broz, a theatre director in Croatia, Svetlana Broz, a cardiologist and writer in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Josip Broz, Joška, Edvard Broz and Natali Klasevski, an artisan of Bosnia-Herzegovina. As the president, Tito had access to extensive state-owned property associated with the office, and maintained a lavish lifestyle. In Belgrade he resided in the official residence, the Beli Dvor, and maintained a separate private home. The Brigini Islands were the site of the state summer residence from 1949 on. The pavilion was designed by Joža Plechnik, and included a zoo. Close to 100 foreign heads of state were to visit Tito at the island residence, along with film stars such as Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, Sofia Loren, Carlo Ponti, and Gina Lolo Brigida. Another residence was maintained at Lake Bled, while the grounds at Caraturdevo were the site of diplomatic hunts. By 1974 the Yugoslav president had at his disposal 32 official residences, larger and small, the yacht Galeb, Seagull, a Boeing 727 as the presidential airplane, and the Blue Train. After Tito's death the presidential Boeing 727 was sold to Aviogenics, the Galeb remained docked in Montenegro, while the Blue Train was stored in a Serbian train shed for over two decades. While Tito was the person who held the office of president for by far the longest period, the associated property was not private and much of it continues to be in use by Yugoslav successor states, as public property, or maintained at the disposal of high-ranking officials. As regards knowledge of languages, Tito replied that he spoke Serbo-Croatian, German, Russian, and some English. Broz's official biographer and then fellow Central Committee member Vladimir Dediher stated in 1953 that he spoke. Serbo-Croatian Russian, Czech, Slovenian German with a Viennese accent understands and reads French and Italian and also speaks Kyrgyz. In his youth Tito attended Catholic Sunday school, and was later an altar boy. After an incident where he was slapped and shouted at by a priest when he had difficulty assisting the priest to remove his vestments, Tito would not enter a church again. As an adult, he identified as an atheist. Every federal unit had a town or city with historic significance from the World War II period renamed to have Tito's name included. The largest of these was Titograd, now Podgorica, the capital city of Montenegro. With the exception of Titograd, the cities were renamed simply by the addition of the adjective Tito's. Tidov. The cities were Topic. Language and identity dispute In the years after Tito's death up to the present, there has been some debate as to his identity. Tito's personal doctor, Alexander Matunovic, wrote a book about Tito in which he questioned his true origin, noting that Tito's habits and lifestyle could only mean that he was from an aristocratic family. Serbian journalist Vladan Dinik, in Tito is not Tito, included several possible alternate identities of Tito, arguing that three separate people had identified as Tito. In 2013, a lot of media coverage was given to a declassified NSA study in cryptologic spectrum that concluded Tito had not spoken the Serbo Croatian language as a native. The report noted that his speech had features of other Slavic languages. Russian and Polish. The hypothesis that a non-Yugoslav, perhaps a Russian or a Pole, assumed Tito's identity was included with a note that this had happened during or before the Second World War. The report notes Draza Mihailovic's impressions of Tito's Russian origins after he had personally spoken with Tito. However, the NSA's report was completely invalidated by Croatian experts. The report failed to recognize that Tito was a native speaker of the very distinctive local Kajkavian dialect of Zagorje. His acute accent, present only in Croatian dialects, and which Tito was able to pronounce perfectly, is the strongest evidence for his Zagorje origins. Topic. Origin of the name, Tito As the Communist Party was outlawed in Yugoslavia starting on 30 December 1920, Josip Broz took on many assumed names during his activity within the party, including Rudy. Walter and Tito. Broz himself explains, It was a rule in the party in those times not to use one's real name, in order to reduce the chances of exposure. For instance, if someone working with me was arrested, and flogged into revealing my real name, the police would easily trace me. 
but the police never knew the real person hiding behind an assumed name, such as I had in the party. Naturally, even the assumed names often had to be changed. Even before going to prison I had taken the name of Gligoryevich, and of Zagorik, meaning the man from Zagorje. I even signed a few newspaper articles with the second. Now I had to take a new name. I adopted first the name of Rudy, but another comrade had the same name and so I was obliged to change it, adopting the name Tito. I hardly ever used Tito at first, I assumed it exclusively in 1938, when I began to sign articles with it. Why did I take this name, Tito, and has its special significance? I took it as I would have any other, because it occurred to me at the moment. Apart from that, this name is quite frequent in my native district. The best known Zagorje writer of the late 18th century was called Tito Brezovatsky. His witty comedies are still given in the Croatian theater after more than a hundred years. The father of K. Saver Sandor Gjalski, one of the greatest Croatian writers, was also called Tito. Topic. Awards and decorations Josip Broz Tito received a total of 119 awards and decorations from 60 countries around the world 59 countries and Yugoslavia, 21 decorations were from Yugoslavia itself, 18 having been awarded once, and the Order of the National Hero on three occasions. Of the 98 international awards and decorations, 92 were received once, and three on two occasions Order of the White Lion, Polonia Restituta, and Karl Marx. The most notable awards included the French Legion of Honor and National Order of Merit, the British Order of the Bath, the Soviet Order of Lenin, the Japanese Order of the Chrysanthemum, the West German Federal Cross of Merit, and the Order of Merit of Italy. The decorations were seldom displayed, however. After the Tito-Stalin split of 1948 and his inauguration as president in 1953, Tito rarely wore his uniform except when present in a military function, and then with rare exception, only wore his Yugoslav ribbons for obvious practical reasons. The awards were displayed in full number only at his funeral in 1980. Tito's reputation as one of the Allied leaders of World War II, along with his diplomatic position as the founder of the Non-Aligned Movement, was primarily the cause of the favorable international recognition. Topic domestic awards Topic Foreign awards Here follows a short list including some of the more notable foreign awards and decorations of Tito. Some of the other foreign awards and decorations of Josip Broz Tito include Order of Merit, Order of Prince Henry, Order of Independence, Order of Merit, Order of the Nile, Order of the Condor of the Andes, Order of the Star of Romania, Order of the Gold Lion of the House of Nassau, Croix de Guerre, Order of the Cross of Grunwald, Czechoslovak War Cross, Decoration of Honor for Services to the Republic of Austria, Military Order of the White Lion, Nishan e Pakistan, Order of Al Rafidane, Order of Carol I, Order of Georgi Dimitrov, Order of Karl Marx, Order of Manuel Amador Guerrero, Order of Michael the Brave, Order of Pavali, Order of Sukhbadar, Order of Suvarov, Order of the Liberator, Order of the October Revolution, Order of the Queen of Sheba, Order of the White Rose of Finland, Partisan Cross, Royal Order of Cambodia and Star of People's Friendship and Thuri Thudama Thingaha. Topic see also List of places named after Josip Broz Tito List of Yugoslav politicians Topic Notes Topic Footnotes Topic Bibliography Adi, Phyllis 1970. Tito, A Biography. New York, New York, McGraw-Hill. OCLC 100536. Banak, Evo 1988. With Stalin against Tito, Cominformist Splits in Yugoslav Communism. Ithaca, New York, Cornell University Press. ISBN 978-0-8014-2186-0. Barnett, Neil. 2006. Tito. London, England, House. ISBN 978-1-904950-31-8. Bornman, John. 2004. Death of the Father, An Anthropology of End in Political Authority. Bergen Books. ISBN 978-1-57181-111-0. Cook, Bernard A. 2001. Europe since 1945, an encyclopedia, volume 2KZ. New York, New York, Garland Publishing Inc. Corbel, Joseph. 1951. Tito's Communism. Denver, Colorado, The University of Denver Press. Dediher, Vladimir. 1952. Tito. New York, New York, Simon & Schuster. ISBN 978-0-405-04565-3. Dediher, Vladimir 1953. 
Tito speaks, his self-portrait and struggle with Stalin. London, England, Weidenfeld and Nicholson. Forsyth, David P., ed., 2009. Encyclopedia of Human Rights. 5. Oxford, England, Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-533402-9. Frankel, Benjamin, 1992. The Cold War, 1945-1991, Leaders and Other Important Figures in the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, China, and the Third World, 2. London, England, Gale Research. ISBN 978-0-8103-8928-1. Finland, Alistair, 2004. The Collapse of Yugoslavia 1991-1999. New York, USA, Osprey Publishing. ISBN 978-1-4728-1027-4. Gilbert, Martin, 2004. The First World War, A Complete History. New York, Henry Holt & Company. ISBN 978-0-8050-7617-2. Jeffries Jones, Rodri, 2013. In Spies We Trust, The Story of Western Intelligence. OUP Oxford. ISBN 978-0-19-958097-2. Kakon, Ivan, Jelisic, Mate, Skunka, Ivan, 1988. Stowaranje Titov Jugoslavi in Serbo-Croatian. Apatija, Yugoslavia, Atakar Kursavani. ISBN 978-86-385-0091-8. Lakor, Walter. Guerrilla Warfare, A Historical and Critical Study. New Brunswick, New Jersey, Transaction Publishers. ISBN 978-1-4128-2488-0. Lee, Kun Choi. Diplomacy of a Tiny State. Singapore, World Scientific. ISBN 978-981-02-1219-3. Lees, Lorraine M. 2006. Keeping Tito Afloat, The United States, Yugoslavia, and the Cold War. Pennsylvania State University Press. ISBN 0-253-34656-8. Mattis, David No More, The Battle Against Human Rights Violations. ISBN 1-55002-221-0. McGoldrick, Dominic Accommodating National Identity in National Law and International Law. In Stephen Tierney. Accommodating National Identity, New Approaches in International and Domestic Law. Martinus Nyhoff Publishers. ISBN 90-411-1400-9. Minahan, James Miniature Empires, A Historical Dictionary of the Newly Independent States. Westport, Connecticut, Greenwood Publishing Group. ISBN 978-0-313-30610-5. Pavlovich, Stephen K. The Improbable Survivor, Yugoslavia and Its Problems, 1918-1988 Online free to borrow Pavlovich, Stephen K. Tito Yugoslavia's Great Dictator, a Reassessment 1992 Online free to borrow Pavlovich, Stephen. Hitler's New Disorder, The Second World War in Yugoslavia 2008 excerpt and text search Ramit, Sabrina Petra 2006. The Three Yugoslavias, State Building and Legitimation, 1918-2005. Bloomington, Indiana, Indiana University Press. ISBN 978-0-253-34656-8. Ridley, Jasper 1994. Tito, A Biography. London, England, Constable and Company. ISBN 0-09-475610-4. Roberts, Walter R. 1987. Tito, Mihailovic and the Allies, 1941-1945. New Brunswick, New Jersey, Duke University Press. ISBN 978-0-8223-0773-0. Swain, Jeffrey 2010. Tito, A Biography. London, England, I.B. Tories. ISBN 978-1-84511-727-6. Sherwood, Timothy H. 2013. The Rhetorical Leadership of Fulton J. Sheen, Norman Vincent Peale, and Billy Graham in the Age of Extremes. Lexington Books. ISBN 978-0-7391-7431-9. Tomasevich, Jozo, Vucinich, Wayne S. 1969. 
Contemporary Yugoslavia, 20 Years of Socialist Experiment. University of California Press. Tomasevich, Jozo War and Revolution in Yugoslavia, 1941–1945, The Chetniks. Stanford, California, Stanford University Press. ISBN 978-0-8047-0857-9. Tomasevich, Jozo War and Revolution in Yugoslavia, 1941–1945, Occupation and Collaboration. Stanford, California, Stanford University Press. ISBN 978-0-8047-3615-2. Turbovich, Anna S. A Legal Geography of Yugoslavia's Disintegration. Oxford, England, Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-533343-5. Winterhalter, Vilko In the Path of Tito. Tunbridge Wells, England, Abacus Press. ISBN 978-0-85626-011-7. Vucinich, Wayne S. 1969. Interwar Yugoslavia. Contemporary Yugoslavia, 20 Years of Socialist Experiment. Berkeley, California, University of California Press. OCLC 652337606. West, Richard Tito and the Rise and Fall of Yugoslavia. New York, New York, Carroll and Graff. ISBN 0-7867-0191-9. Further reading Batty, Peter Hoodwinking Churchill, Tito's Great Confidence Trick. ISBN 978-0-85683-282-6. Beloff, Nora Tito's Flawed Legacy, Yugoslavia and the West Since 1939. Westview PR. ISBN 0-8133-0322-2. Carter, April Marshall Tito, A Bibliography. Greenwood Press. ISBN 0-313-28087-8. Dillas, Milovan Tito, The Story from Inside. Phoenix Press. ISBN 1-84212-047-6. McLean, Fitzroy 1957. Disputed Barricade. London, Jonathan Cape, also published as The Heretic. McLean, Fitzroy 1949. Eastern Approaches. London, Jonathan Cape. McLean, Fitzroy 1980. Tito, A Pictorial Biography. McGraw-Hill. ISBN 0-07-044671-7. Perjevic, Yoja 2016. Tito, Die Biography. Kunstmann Verlag München. ISBN 978-3-95614-097-6. Vachevich, Bosco S. 1994. Tito, Architect of Yugoslav Disintegration. Rivercross Publishing. ISBN 0-944957-46-3. External links Josip Broz Tito Archive at Marxists. Org. A film clip Aviation in the News, the 22nd of June 1944 is available at the Internet Archive Newspaper clippings about Josip Broz Tito in the 20th Century Press Archives of the German National Library of Economics ZBW.